Oké. Okay. Oké. Okay. Alrighty. Alrighty then. You start. Oh. I you, always start. You I start. know. It's just what we do. No. What are we doing? <laughs> Recording a podcast. <laughs> Why? What are you doing? Chilling. Just chilling. Just chilling. Welcome to Dark and Creepy Things with Frank and Scout. Yay. I'm Scout. I'm Frank. And we have... Xander. Xander. Xander joining us. One of our housemates. Yay. Awesome. Um, patrons. Thank yes. you. Thank you, patrons. Yes, I could bring, bring them this stuff. You could. Mm, I should do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the list of patrons. The list of patrons. So the cats that give us some money so the cats don't, don't eat, eat us and we can feed them. <laughs> we did. You're allowed to laugh out loud. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got Sanders trying not to laugh. Trying but... not to spit coffee and food everywhere. I think. <laughs> popcorn. 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 <laughs> All over the computer screen. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, patrons. It's your turn. Um, I might just note that this. Okay. Full disclosure: this is a re-recording of this episode. Yeah. Which my phone was a bitch. The iPhone ate it. And corrupted the file yeah. that we now, spent an hour recording, now recording in a gone. car park. At high point. Yeah, and the phone corrupted the file, so we were recording it. Mm, maybe high point ate the file. I mean, high point is weird. And we were, it's funny when we were recording, all these people were leaving from the movies, so we'd have these sections of just people like, dr- like driving noises as people were being driving. Or walking off. in the car and being like, rah, 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 rah. Yeah, well, yeah. She just had a slide on the car saying, recording. <laughs> <laughs> Soundproof your car, maybe. Yeah, cover it in felt. The inside of it was felt. Mm. All that eggshell stuff. Mm. Mm. Windows too. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can't see. You just open little holes and be like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll just cut out a little. We'll cut out a square for the driver, and we'll take it like like it'll flap, flap. be like a flap, a flap, and you flap it down when you're driving, and you put it back up when you're recording. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> Okay, so All right. it is your turn. It is to my turn. Record. Even though I, I know you want to do reading. And I, like, I actually would prefer that because my voice is still kind of sore from the I choral like, thing. I like reading. Yeah, I know because, you like reading. I don't mind reading too. But yeah. But this is my topic. It's your topic. My one. Um, okay, person. Because I tend to pick people. Yeah, I don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I don't like We're people. We're not people. It's fine. <laughs> We're aliens. I know who this person is, but tell me about this person. Frank's going to pretend to be surprised. <laughs> oh! Like, Frank will actually be surprised. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have a genuine yeah, reaction exactly. here. That's what I wanted. Okay. Amelia Dyer. Amelia Dyer. Mm-hmm. Have you heard this person, Xander? Amelia Dyer. Am- Amelia Elizabeth Dyer, knee hobbly, from, who lived from 1837 to the 10th of June 1896, was one of the most prolific serial killers in history, murdering infants in her care over a 30-year period in Victorian Britain. Hmm. Yeah, Trained as a nurse and widowed in 1869, she turned to baby farming, the practice of adopting unwanted infants in exchange for money mm. in order to support herself. She initially cared for the children legitimately, in addition to having two of her own, but whether intentionally or not, another a number of them died in her care, leading to her conviction up for neg- negligence and six months hard labour. She then began directing murdering... Directly murdering... Directing murdering. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to direct you to she murder. Kinda, well, yeah. Okay, me. we'll get to that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> she kind of did. Really. Yeah. Well, or an accomplice. Um, she then began directly murdering children as she, quote, adopted, uh, strangling at least some of them and disposing of the bodies in order to avoid attention. Mentally unstable, she was committed to several... Shit. Well, we actually <laughs> we'll get into that. that. We'll get into we'll that. We'll get into that. Mentally unstable, she was committed to several mental asylums throughout her life, despite suspicions of feigning, and survived at least one serious suicide attempt. Dyer's downfall came when the bagged corpse of an infant was discovered in the Thames, with evidence leading to her. 
She was arrested on the 4th of April 1896, tried, to, tried for the murder of infant Doris Marmon, and hanged on the 10th of June 1896. At the time of her death, a handful of murders were attributed to her, but there is little doubt she was responsible for many more similar deaths, possibly 400 or more. What? Yeah, right? Yeah. She was dubbed the Ogress of Reading. Uh, she inspired a popular ballad, and her case led to stricter laws for adoption. I think we should, before we go any further, define baby farming. Yes, I was literally about to do that. I also don't know baby. what the word ogress means, but talk about baby farming while I look ogre. it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, no, no, uh, uh, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, ogress. Okay, thanks, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. All right, so baby farming, Wikipedia page, um, says that baby farming is the historical practice of accepting custody of an infant or child in exchange for payment in late Victorian era Britain and less commonly in Australia and the United States. If the infant was young, this in usually included wet nursing, so breastfeeding by a woman, not the mother. Some baby farmers adopted children for lump sum payments while others cared for infants for periodic payments. Um, though baby farmers were paid in the understanding that care would be provided, the term baby farmer was used as an insult, and improper treatment was usually implied. Illegitimacy and its attendant social stigma were usually the impetus. We didn't impetus. Impetus. Uh huh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> impetus. I don't think I've ever heard it like said out, out loud. Said out loud. Mm. Yeah. Impetus. Impetus for a mother's decision to put her children out to nurse with a baby farmer. But baby farming also encompassed foster care and adoption in the period before they were regulated by British law. Wealthier women would also put their infants out to be cared for in the homes of villagers. Claire Tomlin gives a detailed account of this in her biography of Jane Austen, who was fostered in this manner, as were her, all her siblings, from a few months old until they were toddlers. Tomlin emphasises the emotional distance this created. Of course, because of attachment. Yeah, attachment, yeah, I spoke about, yeah, attachment theory and that if you talk to anyone who's ever studied attachment theory, it starts from when you're born, pretty much. Yeah. Like, your attachment to your caregivers is something that occurs yeah, the moment you leave the womb, because if you don't have that proper attachment, you get pretty fucked up. Yeah, can definitely mess you up. Um, particularly in the case of lump sum adoptions, it was more profitable for the baby farmer if the infant or child she adopted died since the small payment could not cover the care of the child for long. Especially the longer the kid lives, the more expensive it's going to be, which we know. Um, some baby farmers adopted numerous children and then neglected them or murdered them outright. Um, infant see, infanticide, which we've, I think we've mentioned infanticide and familiar side in other episodes. Have we? Maybe. Or maybe it's just because I read about it a it's lot. It's probably because you just read a lot of it. Probably. Um, several, so inf infanticide being when people kill their children yeah. or young people. So any word that ends in side means like killing. So homicide, yeah. killing a human. And then you have familiar side, which is people who kill their whole families as well. You know, killing the monarchy as someone part of the royal family is called regicide. Yes. Mm. Regicide. Like yeah. regal. Yeah. Re a regal killing. Yeah. Yes. Like regicide? I thought it was a regicide. I could it be sounds regicide. stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Probably right. But I also feel like it should be regicide. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the baby farmers. <laughs> Several were tried for murder, manslaughter, or criminal neglect and were hanged. Margaret Waters, executed in 1870, and Amelia, Amelia Dyer, executed in 1896, were two infamous British baby farmers, as were Amelia Sack and Annie Walters, executed in 1903. The names are very familiar, very similar to each other. They're very white. Yeah, <laughs> such white British names. <laughs> the last baby farmer to be executed in Britain was Rhoda Willis, who was hanged in Wales in 1907. The only woman to be executed in New Zealand, Minnie Dean, was a baby farmer. In Scandinavia, there was a euphemism for this activity called um, <laughs> Angla Markuska, which is Swedish. Um, oh no, no, that was, sorry, that was Scandinavian. And it is Swedish. Is it? Yeah, it's Swedish. Scandinavia isn't a country. Oh. <laughs> Scandinavia is a group of countries. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I don't know geography. It says Angla Maska, Angla Maker which is in Swedish, and 
Engel Mas- Mas- like, Magus- Maguske, which is Danish. Danish. Both literally meaning a female angel maker. <laughs> kill the babies and the babies become angels. Yeah, yes, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. I suppose because back then, especially yeah. if a baby was killed very, very young before baptism, do they? Depends on what religion. Do they go to heaven or do they go to purgatory? What? Exactly. If you're baptized, if you haven't been baptized, oh, then you are in purg- baby purgatory forever. Then you're not made an angel. No. Then they're yeah. not angel makers. They're baby purgatory ma- makers. Yeah, but back then, they haven't been baptized. Yeah, back then, nearly everyone was baptized. Or standard. Like at like less than a week old. Yes. That yeah. young? I yeah. thought most people don't baptize their babies until they're like a month old. Well, it it depends. Hmm. Yeah, it really depends on the people. Well, maybe well. they weren't killing them until they're a month or two old. Maybe. Yeah. So one of them. Yeah. Yeah. One of, we'll get yeah. to that. We'll get to that. So angel makers. Um, then there's a list of um, mentions of baby farmers in popular culture, which I'll come back to after we go into a bit more about Amelia Dyer. So yes, baby farming. Um, all right. So back to Amelia Dyer. Background. Amelia Dyer was born the youngest of five with three brothers, Thomas, James and William, and a sister Anne, in the small village of Pyle Marsh, just east of Bristol, now part of Bristol's urban sprawl known as Pyle Marsh. The daughter of a master shoemaker, Samuel Hobley, and Sarah Hobley, Nee Weymouth. She learned to read and write and developed a love of literature and poetry. Mm, pretty well off to being taught how to read and write, mm-hmm. especially as a girl. Right. However, her childhood was marred by the mental illness of her mother caused by typhus. Mm. Typhus. What we, was typhus? Typhus is a fever, and we did a little bit of research about this in the last episode that we recorded before my family went to shit. Um, <laughs> before it's, the pipe went it. It's a fever that's carried by parasites, most notably fleas, mm. which makes sense because this is Victorian era England. People didn't realize how bacteria and stuff were transmitted, and fleas were a yeah. big thing. That's my question if it was even mental ill. I guess it probably changed. It's her probably more. Personality. She had brain damage due to a high fever. Yeah. Which can induce mental illness. True. Like, traumatic brain injury yeah. does in, in, can induce mental illness. Mm. So Amelia witnessed her mother's violent fits and was obliged to care for her until she died, raving in 1848. So she literally went like stark raving mad as yeah. where that saying comes from. Um, researchers later com- commented on the effect this had on Dyer and also what it taught her about the symptoms exhibited by those who appear to lose their mind through illness. Oh my god, I just realised having the already connection. read the rest of the article. We'll talk about this in yes. a sec, but that's where she... Oh, no, okay. So she learned to behave. Yeah, yeah, okay. Dyer had an elder sister, Sarah Ann, who died in 1841, age six, and a younger sister, also named Sarah Ann, <laughs> who died in 1845. Replacement. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, yeah, literally, a age of few months. Sarah Basically, Anne. oh, Sarah Ann died. Oh, I'll have another one. Let's call that one Sarah yeah. Ann. I really like that name. <laughs> said, said them. <laughs> Let's just call all the children Sarah Ann. <laughs> an elder cousin had an illegitimate daughter at the time who was later accepted as the daughter of the grandparents, Dyer's aunt and uncle, William and Martha Hobley. After her mother's death, Amelia lived with an aunt in Bristol for a while before serving an apprenticeship with a corset maker. Her father died in 1859. Her eldest brother, Thomas, inherited the family shoe business. In 1861, at the age of 24, Amelia became permanently estranged estranged from at least one of her brothers, um, James, and moved into lodgings in Trinity Street, Bristol. There she married George Thomas. How old was she? 24. 24. Yeah. This is where she married George Thomas. George was 59. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Same I mean, I mean, age is just a number, but yeah, still, but that's, that's just weird. That's old enough to be. That's father. thirty. Yeah, yeah more than thirty-five taller. years difference. Yeah, George was fifty-nine, and they both lied about their ages on the marriage certificate to reduce the age gap. George deducted eleven years from his age, and Amelia added six to her age. So he would have then said he's forty-eight, and she's thirty. Thirty. Yeah, which is still an eighteen. Still years. eighteen years yeah. difference. Many sources later reported this age as fact, causing much confusion. So no one really knew who the hell they were. (laughs) Alright. 
nursing. After marrying George Thomas, Dyer trained as a nurse. From contact with a midwife, Alan Dane, she learned of an easier way to earn a living, using her own home to provide lodgings for young women who had conceived illegitimately, and then farming off the babies for adoption, or allowing them to die of neglect and malnutrition. Ellen Dane was forced to decamp to the US shortly after meeting Amelia to escape the attention of the authorities. Unmarried mothers in Victorian Britain were often struggled to gain an income since the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act had removed any financial obligation from the fathers of illegitimate children. Whilst bringing up their children in a society where single parenthood and illeg- illegitimacy were stigmatised. Single parenthood and, and illegitimacy obviously is not as stigmatised now as it was then, but it's still a thing. Yeah, of course. Like, people still, people still look down it, yeah. upon single parents, and especially, actually, single fathers. Mm-hmm. Like, who are, who are the primary carers of their yeah, children. True. It's It's still kind of gross yeah true because people are like ooh where's the mother where's the mother yeah and like I like people have said to me people I've known who are single fathers have said to me oh the mother's not in the picture like yeah. he had to he had to justify it yeah. in some way yeah. and it was like you don't need to justify that yeah, you're a parent you're like, a parent I don't care yeah like it's somehow weirder that there's yeah. a man raising children yeah a good friend of mine like one of my best friends growing up yeah she was her main caregiver was her father yeah as well how it was and she did which was kind of the opposite of me like she would go to her mum's every second weekend mm, which yeah. was a bit weird but it yeah. does, does happen it's just not as common I guess um, so anyway all this stigma um, led to the practice of baby farming in which individuals acted as adoption or fostering agents in return for regular payments or a single upfront fee from the baby's mothers many businesses were set up to take in these young women and care for them until they gave birth the mothers subsequently left their unwanted babies to be looked after as nurse children in quotation marks look kind of reminds me there's this episode of call the midwife Mm. where these young women who are illegitimately pregnant get sent to that's right it's not a mother house but it's it's similar yeah where you, that's where you go to have the baby yes. and then they either yeah. you get someone the government either takes it up for adoption mm. or you go home with it like but you have or, it in secret yes yeah or you sell it to a baby farmer yeah well back this was in the 1950s but baby farmers didn't exist anymore oh um, yeah, I guess not. Not, not to this extent, no. I wouldn't have thought. But it was really shitty because the wife who was... The wife, the midwife, mm. the nurse who was looking after these women gave no shits at all. Mm. She was, like, drinking on the job and, like... Yeah. And telling the girls to shut up. Yeah, and, like, I remember that. You're all awful, horrible people for getting pregnant. Yeah. Like, stuff shit. like that. Yeah. And it was just like, this you're is shit. horrendous. Shut up. You brought this on yourselves. Have yeah. your baby and get out. Yeah. yeah, it was horrendous. And, like, not calling the doctor until like way too late yeah when i was like bleed up yeah it was just like what the fuck yeah the predicament of the parents involved was often exploited for financial gain if a baby had well-off parents who were simply anxious to keep the birth secret the single fee might be as much as 80 pounds 50 pounds might be negotiated if the father of the child wanted to hush up his involvement however it was more common for these expectant young women to be impoverished such women would be charged about five pounds so pretty cheap baby even back then and um, unscrupulous carers resorted to starving the farmed out babies to save money and even hasten even to hasten death Noisy or demanding babies could be sedated with easily available alcohol and or opiates. Godfrey's Cordial, known colloquially as Mother's Friend, a syrup containing opium, was a frequent choice, but there were several other uh, similar preparations. Many children died as a result of such dubious practices. Quote, opium killed far more infants through starvation than directly through overdose. Mm. Dr. Greenhow, investigating for the Privy Council, noted how children, quote, kept in a state of continued narcotism, will be thereby disinclined for food and be but imperfectly nourished. So, I just looked up something. So I was interested to see how many, how much money 80 pounds was oh, yeah. in today's rate. It's 10,000 pounds. Far out. Which is equivalent to 18,000 Australian dollars. Now. Now. Fuck, that's a lot. That's the equivalent. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> what was the other one? Five pounds? Five pounds if you're poor. So five pounds if you're poor. Ten thousand ten thousand pounds if you're poor or six hundred dollars if sorry, ten thousand pounds if you're rich or six hundred pounds if you're poor. Which is now worth what? About a grand. Okay. Still a lot of money to come up with. Yeah, you know, like that a is single, yeah. single pregnant woman with not no money. Um Death from, okay, so yeah, drugging the babies. Death from severe malnutrition would result, but the coroner was likely to record the death as debility from birth or lack of breast milk or simply starvation. Mothers who chose to reclaim or simply check on the welfare of their children would could often encounter difficulties, but some would simply be too frightened or ashamed to tell the police about any suspected wrongdoing. Even the authorities often had problems tracing any children that were reported missing. This was the world opened up to Amelia Dyer by the now departed Alan Dane. Dyer had to leave nursing with the birth of a daughter, Alan Thomas. In 1869, the elderly, <laughs> this is the elderly, George Thomas, her husband. 1869, how many years was it after they got married? Um, where is the part where they got married? Background. Um, 1861. So this is 1869? No, it's only eight years later. Eight years. And he's he was elderly. 67, though. So it was elderly for back then. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He was elderly yeah. now. Yeah, her elderly husband, George Thomas, died. And Amelia, of course, needed an income. It's interesting. Just I just realised. A she widow named, with a baby. She just named her daughter Ellen. Yeah. And the midwife who told her all about this is named Ellen. Is Ellen. Yeah, I just realised that, too. Ooh. It's just lack of imagination. Like, there there's how many people who are named Sarah Ann, Sarah Ann, Sarah Ann, and you're Sarah Ann. There's a lot of names going around. There's a lot of names, no. going, around. There's a lot of names no. going around in no. Victorian England. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Can you imagine? My Maltese heritage is the same, but your name's Carmen, and your name's Carmen, and you're Mary, and you're Paul. <laughs> and you that know, is my whole family. Yeah. <laughs> Carmen and Mary and Paul. Yes. yes. Can you imagine <laughs> if it was like online and everyone had to have unique names? Oh, right. Like, <laughs> like Gamer Tag. Like, yeah. you, sorry, this name's already taken. Like, imagine going to the birth of some marriages like Sally and one one two five four. Yeah. <laughs> Try adding some digits. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so then we're up to the murders. Dyer was Dyer was apparently keen to make money from baby farming, and alongside taking in a, it, taking in expectant women, she advertised to nurse and adopt a baby in return for a substantial one-off payment and adequate clothing for the child. In her advertisement, advertisements, advertisement, <laughs> shut up. In her advertisements <laughs> and meetings with clients, she assured them that she was respectable and married and that she would provide a safe and loving home for the child. I mean, technically she was married. Her husband was just dead. So <laughs> it's interesting to know like what if he did actually die of natural causes? What do you think she drugged him to death? Probably. Or Have some more mother's helper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, gonna kill you. Shut up your whining. Here's the mother's helper. <laughs> yeah. In 1872 Amelia married William Dyer, a brewer's labourer from Bristol. They had two children together, Mary Ann. <laughs> Sarah Ann, Mary no, Ann, also known as Polly. <laughs> like, where do you get that from? Where does the name Polly even come from? Is it a shortening or something? Ooh, I don't know if it's a shortening of Mary Ann, but it's not a shortening of Mary Ann. Huh? Penelope? Pollyanna? Pollyanna, yeah. Pollyanna? Oh, I like the name Pollyanna. Um, and they also had William Samuel. Amelia eventually left her husband. At some point in her baby farming career, Dyer decided to forgo the expense and inconvenience of letting the children die through neglect and starvation. In- inconvenience. So inconvenient to let that baby die. Soon after the receipt of each t- child, she murdered them, thus allowing her to pocket most or all of the fee. For some time, Dyer eluded the resulting interest of police. She was eventually caught in 1879 after a doctor was suspicious about the number of child deaths he had been called to to certify in Dyer's care. Yeah, can you imagine that going Another like, one's dead. Mm, another one in the Dyer <laughs> place is dead. Yeah. That's a bit weird. That's, that, how, what a coincidence. We've also got to remember, though, the reason she would have gotten away with so many is Victorian England babies died all the fucking yeah. time. Like, yeah. the infant, infant mortality rate was 
very bad. Yeah. And so, in other words, the doctor probably wouldn't have been suspicious until, like, I don't know, 50 babies probably. had died or something. <laughs> yeah, it probably was about that. Whereas so nowadays, it's like one baby dies, it's like, what the fuck yeah. happened? Yeah. However, instead of being convicted of murder or manslaughter, she was sentenced to six months hard labour for neglect. <laughs> the experience allegedly almost destroyed her mentally. Though others have expressed incredulity at the leniency of the sentence when compared to those handed out for lesser crimes at the time. So basically, she got a slap on the wrist. But also, she was an educated yeah. white woman. Yeah. Probably quite well off. Yeah. Definitely. You've got yeah. to remember, classism is a huge oh, thing. Oh, for sure. She for wouldn't sure. have been... If she was, I don't know... And plus putting on the pretense of being, you know, a lovely, caring family woman yeah. and all that kind of stuff. If she had been, like, I don't know a poor person living on the street, she probably would have ended up in jail yeah. the first time. But she wouldn't have had the means to kill off babies besides neglecting them anyway. Yeah. Or t- she wouldn't have the means to take them in. Yeah. Um, upon release, she attempted to resume her nursing career. She had spells in mental hospitals due to her alleged mental instability and suicidal tendencies. These always coincided with times when it was convenient for her to disappear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Being a former asylum nurse, Dyer knew and experienced with her own mother. Her mother, yes. Yeah, Dyer nurse, knew how to behave to ensure a relatively comfortable existence as an asylum inmate. <laughs> Dyer appears to have begun abusing alcohol and opium-based products early in her killing career. Her mental instability could have been related to a substance abuse. Dishwasher. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Xander's just looking around the room like, what is happening? Um, in 1890, Dyer cared for the illegitimate baby of a governess. When she returned to visit the child, the governess was immediately suspicious and stripped the baby to see if a birthmark was present on one of its hips. It wasn't. And prolonged suspicions by the authorities led to Dyer having or feigning a breakdown. See, I'm not, like, us- <laughs> I'm not usually one. I never usually say people are faking mental illness, yeah, ever. Know, I'm, like, I'm like, if you feel the need to fake mental illness, you probably have mental right. illness, you know what I mean? Yeah. But in this case... I don't see any evidence to say that she's not u- abusing that. Oh, for sure. She's abusing her knowledge and yeah. experience. Of, obviously, yeah. yeah. She obviously had the experience with her mother. She's had... In, and working. And working in an asylum. Yeah. In a, an, asi- uh, an asylum. An insane asylum. Yeah. As a nurse. As a nurse. Like, yeah. she obviously has the experience in order to profit off that, I suppose. Yeah. And, yeah, to demonstrate... And, it, and the fact that it just happens to coincide with times where she may have been caught. Yeah, like, like literally this governess going, you know, this baby has no birthmark. It's not my baby. What have you done with my baby? Yeah. Oh, I'm mentally unwell. Yeah. <laughs> it's made me to the asylum. Um, yeah, very convenient. Um, so, yeah. Dyer at one point drank two bottles of laudanum in a serious suicide attempt, but her long-term abuse had built up her tolerance to opium products, so she survived. Laudanum is like yeah, this opium. Was it 10%, 10% opium? Yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, she returned to baby farming and murder. Dyer <laughs> realised... She just returned to Yeah, murder. she got out of this... She yeah, survived drinking this, this drink of 10% opium um, and then got out and returned to baby farming and murder. Dyer realised the folly of involving doctors to issue death certificates. <laughs> How dare she? How stupid. And began disposing of the bodies herself. The precarious nature and extent of her activities again prompted undesirable attention. She was alert to the attentions of police and of parents seeking to reclaim their children. She and her family frequently relocated to different towns and cities to escape suspicion, regain an anonymity. Yeah, I think that, yeah. No, that's not right either. <laughs> anonymity. That one, thank you. <laughs> um, and to acquire new business. Over the years, Dyer used a succession of aliases to acquire new babies. Yes, like, yeah. more like yeah, new business, new babies. In 1893, Dyer was discharged from her final committal at the Somerset and Bath Lunatic Asylum near Wells. Unlike previous breakdowns, this had been a most disagreeable experience, and she never entered another asylum. She goes, fuck that shit, I'm not going back. Yeah, like, they weren't nice to her that time. <laughs> yeah. Weren't, Two, they weren't taking her shit. Too much. Two years later, Dyer moved to Cavisham, Berkshire, accompanied by an unsuspecting associate, Jane Granny Smith. 
whom Dyer <laughs> had recruited from a brief spell in a workhouse, and Dyer's daughter and son-in-law, Marianne, known as Polly, and Arthur Palmer. This was followed by a move to 45 Kensington Road, Reading, Berkshire, later the same year. Smith was pers- persuaded by Dyer to be referred to as mother in front of innocent women handing over their children. This was an effort to present a caring mother-daughter image. Wow. What, what is this old woman doing? Like, how, Which uh, one? How does she... Granny Smith. How does yeah. she not realise what the fuck is going on? Unsuspecting accomplice. Like, no. No. Yeah. Like, not, how do you even... Associate. How do you even be unsuspecting in this... In, in this? Well, because she would have been like, yeah, let's... let's this is... A, we can get babies. We can care for them. <laughs> but how does She's the, like, oh, that sounds good. And but then how does the, she not realise the babies are just going missing? Oh, I'm sure she did eventually. Um, we're up to okay. So, case study: the murder of Doris Marmon. In January 1896, Evelina Marmon, a popular 25-year-old barmaid, gave birth to an illegitimate daughter, Doris. In a <laughs> sorry, the baby Doris. Yeah. Call you Doris. <laughs> in a boarding house in Cheltenham, she quickly sought offers of adoption and placed an advertisement in the miscellaneous section of the Bristol Times and Mirror newspaper. It simply read. Quote, wanted respectable woman to take young child. End quote. <laughs> Marmon intended to go back to work and hoped to eventually reclaim her child. I mean, it's kind of smart. Like, you need to keep working. Just pay someone to to raise, yeah. raise it till it's old enough to kind of look after itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It kind of reminds me of Les Mis, actually. Okay. Because in Les Mis, Fontaine, I think her name is is trying to look for work. She has mm. an illegitimate daughter. That's and right. the illegitimate daughter is looked after by these two horrible people who mm. run an inn. Yeah. That's right? probably a yeah. similar situation. And they were using the daughter as yeah. cheap labour. Yeah. Because the daughter was like six. Yeah. She was old enough to work. Yes. But she was spoiled back. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, Fontaine ends up dying because she spoiler. has... She, spoiler. If you haven't ever seen <laughs> Les Mis, Fontaine ends up dying. But she's, Fontaine sends all her money to this inn to look after yeah. her daughter. Yeah. Um, okay, so coincidentally, next to her own was an advertisement reading, quote, married couple with no family would adopt healthy child. Nice country home. Mm-hmm. Terms, £10. <laughs> End quote. Marvin responded to a Mrs. Harding, and a few days later she received a reply from Dyer. From Oxford Road in Reading, Mrs. Harding wrote that I should be glad to have a dear little baby girl, one I could bring up and call my own. She continued, we are plain, homely people, in fair, fairly good circumstances. I don't want a child for money's sake, <laughs> but for company and home comfort. And why say that? Myself and my husband are dearly fond of children. I have no children of my own. A child with me will have a good home and a mother's love. No. <laughs> but that's like the part. I don't want a child for money's sake. <laughs> don't believe you. But don't okay. say that. Why would why would you say that? Also, I like, want a child, not for money. But also, like, yeah, exactly. Is that that thing where, like, I wouldn't have thought you would say. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't have thought about it until you said it. I hurt my leg. I wasn't drunk. <laughs> like, like yeah, me. I didn't think you weren't <laughs> gonna be drunk until you said that you weren't. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? And then she's like, "Ah, oh, oh, they want the child for company." Yeah, the children are there for company. I'm pretty sure that's why my mum had me. <laughs> I mean, but that's, that's also, true. But that's I remember also saying really... that one day. She, I know it's awful to put that on a child it on an unborn child. Really or, awful. Oh, I was bored and I wanted company. It's awful. I know. You fill your life with other things, right? Not Bring a children. being into the world to Don't fill a hole friends. in your life, right? That was I don't know. Go to the pub and chat whoever's at the bar. Yeah, yeah like, whatever. Yeah, just have yeah, children. Or get a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Evelina <laughs> knitting circle, <laughs> right? A, a knitting circle, Sewing circle in quotation marks. Sewing circle. <laughs> Evelina Marmon wanted to pay a more affordable weekly fee for the care of her daughter, but Mrs. Harding insisted on being given the one-off payment in advance. Marmon was in dire straits, so she reluctantly agreed to pay the £10, and a week later, Mrs. Harding arrived in Cheltenham. 
Marmon was apparently surprised by Dyer's advanced age and stocky appearance, but as Dyer was affectionate towards Doris, Evelina handed over her daughter a cardboard box of clothes and the ten pounds. Still distressed at having to give up care for her daughter, Evelina accompanied Dyer to Chatham Station and then on to Gloucester. Is that his name? Gloucester. 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 She returned to her lodgings a broken woman. A few days later, she received a letter from Mrs. Harding saying all was well. Marmon wrote back, but received no reply. <sighs> Dyer did not travel to Reading, and she, as she had told Marmon, she went instead to 76 Mayo Road, Williston, London, where her 23-year-old daughter Polly was staying. There, Dyer quickly found some white edging tape used in dressmaking, wound it twice around the baby's neck and tied a knot. Death would not have been immediate. Dyer lady set, later said, I used to like to watch them with the tape around their neck, but it was soon all over with them. You absolute yeah, freak. Absolute uh, freak. What a fucking creep. Um, both women allegedly helped to wrap the body in a napkin. <laughs> <laughs> a napkin. Well, like, yes, a, a napkin's like a, a pretty big. Like a proper, like a proper one. one. Not like a, not like a tissue. Like a yeah. <laughs> like it a proper fancy napkin. Formal dining. Formal, yeah. Yes, right. Yeah, formal would, dining. If you think about a dining napkin, they're pretty. Could probably fit a baby. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The, they kept. Small baby. Yeah. <laughs> they kept some of the clothes Marmon had packed. The rest was destined for the pawnbroker. Dyer paid the rent to the unwitting landlady, landlady and gave her a pair of child's boots as a present for a little girl. Creep. The following day, Wednesday, the 1st of April, 1896, another child named Harry Simmons was taken to Mayo Road. However, with no spare white edging tape available, the length around Doris's corpse was removed and used to strangle the 13th. 13 month old boy. 13 months old this boy was. I was a, a bit like, what the hell was yeah. this? Because this boy, 13 months old, he it's would like have been toddler size, toddler size like nearly walking, Probably, yeah. potentially starting to talk. Yeah. Like, this isn't just a baby that's just like an inanimate object. This is right. a human. <laughs> You know what I mean? Let that be known. Like, Frank thinks that babies are inanimate objects. I don't think objects. they're inanimate objects, but like, you know <laughs> you what I mean? If you have like a, a month old baby. It doesn't really have a personality. Exactly. It yeah. just sits there and cries and shits. And shits and it eats. Yeah, and sleeps. maybe might smile. But that's about it, right? Unlikely under these circumstances. No, I mean, you're You'd in Victorian not. England. But yeah. No one smiles no in Victorian England. <laughs> but a 13-month-old boy has personality at this point. Like, yeah. This isn't... And it's a bit more robust. Than and it's like a fully-fledged human. Baby as well. <laughs> like, um, what the fuck? It gets better. On the 2nd of April, both bodies were stacked into a carpet bag. Carpet bags. Mary Poppins. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Along with bricks for added weight. Aww. Dyer then headed for Reading. At a secluded spot she knew well near a weir at Cavisham Lock, she forced the carpet bag through railings into the River Thames. <sighs> you yeah. absolutely Ugh. Ugh. Right, Dyer's downfall. Discovery of corpses. Unbeknownst to Dyer, on the 30th of March 1896, a package was retrieved from the Thames at Reading by a bargeman. The package Dyer dumped was not weighted adequate, adequately and had been easily spotted. Should have used more bricks. <laughs> it contained the body of a baby girl, later identified as Helena Fry. That's a new name. Mm -hmm. uh, in the small detective force available to Reading Borough Police, Detective Constable Anderson made a crucial breakthrough. As well as finding a label from Temple Mead Station, Bristol, he used mic microscopic analysis of the wrapping paper and deciphered a faintly legible name, Mrs. Thomas, <laughs> and an address. Idiot. The evidence <laughs> was enough to lead police to Dyer, but they still had no strong evidence to connect her directly with a serious crime. I call bullshit on that. Right? No strong evidence. No strong evidence, yet we found a... Baby corpse wrapped in paper with your name and address on it. Plus, there's been like kids going missing. Yeah, in your care. how is that not strong evidence? I don't understand. Yeah, additional evidence they gleaned from witnesses and information obtained from Bristol police only served to increase their concerns. You think? And DC <laughs> Anderson with Sergeant James placed Dyer's home under surveillance. 
<laughs> I don't know, that's CCTV. But... <laughs> I don't think it would have been CCTV. What would they do then? Just it would have been out. someone camping out yeah. in front of her house. Subsequent intelligence suggested that Dyer would abscond if she came at all under suspicion. Of course, she would be like, oh, she'd be like fuck this shit, I'm out. I'm out. Have any breakdown. It's part of being her partner. Yeah. yeah. The officers decided to use a young woman as a decoy, hoping she would be able to secure a meeting with Dyer to discuss her services. This may have been designed to help the detectives to positively link Dyer to her business activities, or it may have simply given them a reliable opportunity to arrest her. It transpired that Dyer was expecting her new client, the decoy, to call, but instead she found detectives waiting on her doorstep. Dun, dun, dun. <gasps> on the 3rd of April, Good Friday, police raided her home. They were apparently struck by the stench of human decomposition, although no human remains were found. Man, that would have been Ugh. just in everything, like in the carpet, in the walls. There was, however, plenty of other related evidence, including white edging tape, telegrams regarding adoption arrangements, porn tickets for children's clothing, receipts for advertisements, and letters from mothers inquiring about the well-being of their children. But Again, idiot. She's an idiot. Why did she keep all that <laughs> Why? evidence? Like, Why keep the letters? You're not going to be in contact with these women again. Or the tickets burn from, like, getting, you know, pawning the children's clothing. Just like, burn like, it. Go back and get them. Right? Exactly. Just burn She's it. She's going to change her mind. Oh, God. What an idiot. <laughs> the police calculated that in the previous few months alone, at least 20 children had been placed in the care of a Mrs. Thomas, now revealed to be Amelia Dyer. It also appeared that she was about to move home again. Shock. Mm -hmm. um, this time to Somerset. This rate of murder has led to some estimates that Mrs. Dyer may, over the course of decades, have killed over 400 babies and children, making her one of the most prolific murderers ever. Well, think about it conservatively. Say she killed 10 babies a month. And that's kind of conservative. Maybe even 120 a year. Yeah, 120 a year. Fuck. And that's over, a f yeah, four years to be 400. Say it's five a month. Yeah, this is saying over a decade. Like, well, it's probably good year. more. Mm. 60 a year in 10 years, that's 600 babies. Yeah. Yeah. Dyer was arrested on the 4th of April and charged with murder. Murder? Her son-in-law, Arthur Palmer, was charged as an accessory. Because they were living together. Yeah, they were. Yeah, her daughter Polly and her husband, yep. Arthur. During April, the Thames was dredged. Come on, they like, just fully dredged the Thames for this. And six more bodies were discovered, including Doris Marmon and Harry Simmons. Remember the yeah. baby and then the 13-month-old? Dyer's last victims. Each baby had been strangled with white tape, which, as she later told the police, quote, was how you could tell it was one of mine. <laughs> Leave me a calling card. 11 days after handing her daughter to Dyer, Evelina Marmon, whose name had emerged in items kept by Dyer, identified her daughter's remains. Oh, oh that poor woman. Um, inquest and trial. Oh, man, her picture, police photo, I guess it's like a mugshot, is pretty hilarious. She does not look <laughs> happy. I would not leave my child with her. I wouldn't even leave him sea monkey with her. She does look a bit creepy. <laughs> she looks pretty pissed off. Um, <laughs> inquest and trial. At the inquest into the deaths in early May, no evidence was found that Mary Ann or, or Mary Ann is Polly, or Arthur Palmer had acted as Dyer's accomplices. Arthur Palmer was discharged as a result of a confession written by Amelia Dyer. In Reading Jail, she wrote, with her own spelling and punctuation preserved, Sir, will you kindly... Actually, I shouldn't have paused there. There's no comma. Sir, will you kindly... Sir, will you kindly grant me the favour of presenting this to the magistrates on Saturday the 18th instant I have made the statement out, for I may not have the opportunity then I must relieve my mind. I do know and I feel my days are numbered on this earth, but I do feel it is an awful thing drawing innocent people into trouble. I do know I shall have to answer before my maker in heaven for the awful crimes I have committed, but as God Almighty is my judge in heaven, a on earth, neither my daughter Mary Ann Palmer nor her husband Alfred Ernest Palmer, I do most I do most solemnly declare neither of them had anything 
at all to do with it. They never knew I contemplated doing such a wicked thing until it was too late. I am speaking the truth and nothing but the truth as I hope to be forgiven. I myself and I alone must stand before my maker in heaven to give an answer for it or witness my hand, Amelia Dyer. <laughs> so that's all one sentence. All one sentence, no full stops. It's like two commas in there. Which is making me wonder, this woman has been to have been taught how to read and write. Yeah. By well, who? <laughs> well, it doesn't mean that, like, yeah, commas were... That's yeah, so but pretty she good. should know. It is very, it is pretty good. Yeah, I suppose by Victorian standards. Yeah, yeah. She should this know where a full April stop 8th, goes. April sixteenth, eighteen ninety six. I mean, she put a full stop at the end of it all. <laughs> Thank goodness. Just could have been like four, four, four sentences at least. On the twenty second of May, eighteen ninety six, Dyer appeared at the Old Bailey and pleaded guilty to one murder, that of Doris Marmon. Her family and associates testified at a trial that they had been growing suspicious and uneasy about her activities and it emerged that Dyer had narrowly escaped discovery on several occasions. Evidence from a man who had seen and spoken to Dyer when she had disposed of the two bodies at Cavisham Lock, that's probably the bargeman, yeah. also proved significant. Her daughter had given graphic evidence that ensured Dyer's conviction. Ooh, but Polly. also, can we talk about the daughter for a sec? Polly. Why the fuck didn't she say anything if she wasn't involved? Oh, because obviously she was a very... Yeah, you know, uh, what's it called? Like willing daughter. No, but the uh, what's her name? Dyer is very probably very charismatic. Yeah, charming. And, yeah, I guess. But at the same face, time, but... I mean, the Stockholm syndrome maybe. But also, yeah, she probably grew up with her mother doing this sort of shit. Yeah, and also she probably wouldn't have known how to fend for herself without her mother like yeah. supporting her. But she had a husband. She was married, but she had a husband. Yeah, but you got a question: Why the husband and her were then mar- living with? Yeah, so Dyer why well. was the like, husband did he not involved? Have a job or, why you know, was the husband like letting this happen? Well, why weren't they a self-sufficient married couple? Why were they living? Yeah, with their they must have been involved in some way. They must have been. They must have been. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. So the daughter gave evidence. The only defence Dyer offered was insanity. She had been twice committed to asylums in Bristol. However, the prosecution argued successfully that her exhibitions of mental instability had been a ploy to avoid suspicion. Both committals were said to have con- coincided with times when Dyer was concerned her crimes might have been exposed. Which we knew. She was yeah. totally faking it. It took the jury only four and a half minutes to find her guilty. <laughs> I just imagine, I was thinking about this, just imagine going into the room as like, everyone agrees this woman's cra- like this woman is evil and she does yesterday okay did she do it yeah yeah <laughs> let's go back three, in her three weeks in the condemned cell she filled five exercise books with her last true and only confession above visited one probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> every four exercise books of just one, one sentence, sentence. Visited the night before execution by the chaplain and asked if she had anything to confess. She offered him her exercise books, saying, isn't this enough? Curiously, she was subpoenaed to appear as a witness in Polly's trial for for murder, set for a week after her own execution date. (laughs) (laughs) However, it was ruled... Seance in the court. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) However, it was ruled that Dyer was already legally dead once sentenced, which we thought was really interesting to get sentenced and therefore you become legally dead um, and therefore evidence would be inadmissible. That's, that's the thing, I don't think that's a thing now because I should Shouldn't imagine people who are on death row surely they would be able to be called They'd as be like, witnesses. like, oh you've, done, you've got this speeding fight, <laughs> ah, mate I'm dead. Yeah, I'm dead, <laughs> Sars. Yeah. Can't, can't do anything, I'm dead. Yeah, can't do it, I'm dead. Um, <laughs> thus her execution was not delayed. On the eve of her execution, Dyer heard that the charges against Polly had been dropped. Dyer was hanged by James Billington at Newgate Prison on Wednesday the 10th of June 1896. Asked on the scaffold if she had anything to say, she said, I have nothing to say, just before (laughs) being dropped at 9am precisely. So so we were actually talking about how she was only on death row for three weeks. Yeah, so And then then you think about the people who, in the States, Mm. who are on death row for potentially decades. Decades. Yeah. And it's just like, I feel like being on death row for that long and not knowing when you're going to die. Torturous. So cruel. Yeah. So cruel. Mm -hmm. Like, can you imagine that? Yeah, but maybe that's part of the punishment. I think it is, but it's such a cruel punishment. Like, I mean, some people do argue that the death penalty should still be a thing. don't get put on death row for, like, 
basic crime. No, you don't. But at the same time, I don't feel like you should be tormented in that way. Yeah, but there's also a lot of, like, um, people wrongfully accused and evicted evicted as well that are on death row. Uh, Later developments. It is uncertain how many more children Amelia Dyer murdered. However, inquiries from mothers, evidence of other witnesses, and material found in Dyer's homes, uh, including letters and many babies' clothes, pointed to many more. The Dyer case caused a scandal. She became known as the Ogress of Reading, so female ogre. Female ogre. <laughs> and she inspired a popular ballad, which I have no idea what this ballad is or the tune that it should be sung in. Um, I don't even know if it has a name. No, the link just comes back to itself, which is weird. Um, it goes, the old baby farmer, the wretched Miss Dyer, at the Old Bailey, her wages is paid. In times long ago, we'd made, we'd a made a big fire and roasted so nicely that wicked old Jade. Essentially, I think it's saying um, she got what she what she asked for when she went to the old Bailey. She deserved. Yeah. She's what she deserved. Yeah, yeah. And then long ago, they would have burnt her at the stake. Oh, that's true. Because yeah, they would have fire. said yeah. she was like almost probably a witch. Yeah. Adoption laws were subsequently made stricter, luckily, giving local authorities the power to police baby farms in the hope of stamping out abuse. Despite this and the scrutinising of newspaper personal ads, the trafficking and abuse of infants did not stop. Two years after Dyer's execution, railway workers inspecting carriages at Newton Abbott, Devon, found a parcel. Inside was a three-week-old girl. But, though cold and wet, she was alive. The daughter of a widow, Jane Hill, the baby had been given to a Mrs. Stewart for £12. She had picked up the baby at Plymouth and apparently dumped it on the next train. It has been claimed that Mrs. Stewart was Polly, the daughter of Amelia Dyer. <laughs> but I find it so fascinating that instead of killing her, she just dumped her. Yeah. Dumped the baby. Maybe she didn't actually have the stomach for it. Probably not. Mummy had always done it. That's true. Yeah, probably Never. not. She probably did everything else except for yeah. the actual killing. Yeah, everything and she was like, I'll just dump it and eventually it'll just die. Yeah. So the actual I only identified victims of um, Dyer, Amelia Dyer, was Doris Marmon, four months old, Harry Simmons, 13 months old, and Helena Fry, age unknown, <gasps> one year old or less. Yawning. Yeah. Um, this is the Jack the Ripper speculation. <laughs> Raised my friends. Yeah. Because she was a murderer alive at the time of Jack of the Jack the Ripper killings, some have suggested that Dyer was Jack the Ripper, who killed the prostitutes through botched abortions. But I really don't think prost- killing prostitutes was a thing. But she also, was obviously a baby killer. I also don't think she was in London at the time. The suggestion was... Been. I yeah. also don't think she was meticulous enough right? to have gotten away with it like Jack the Ripper. No, yeah. she kept everything. Yeah. What yeah. would she only keep things about babies and not the prostitutes. I, yeah, I don't believe that either. The suggest- this suggestion was put forward by author William Stewart, although he preferred Mary Piercy as his chosen suspect. But interesting that he thinks Jack the Ripper was a woman. Um, there is, however, no evidence to connect Dyer to the Jack the Ripper murders. I do have heard that some people do think Jack the Ripper was a woman. Yeah. And if it if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because Jack the Ripper only killed prostitutes. Yeah. And people back Be then had men. but like if it was a man it would be kind of like why like it's like woman killing the worst of her own kind mm-hmm. if that makes sense like she's killing this the, the bad repu- the women with the bad reputation whereas ma- a man killing a prostitute just seems too obvious yeah, you know what I mean I guess like it just seems yeah. like oh you just hate women women yeah um so I go back over flip back over to the baby farming article uh, in popular culture and I remember reading these to Frank when the recording didn't work um, and I go, ah, that's right yeah. so the title character in Charles Dickens Oliver Twist spends his first years in a baby farm hmm. yeah the, 
eponymous eponymous uh, eponymous eponymous heroin puts her newborn out to nurse with a baby farmer in George Moore's Esther Waters from 1894 mm. the main character in Perfume John Baptiste Grinoli is orphaned shortly after birth and brought up in a baby farmer style orphanage mm-hmm. uh, oh no can you just nod in it's like yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 the character of Mrs. Suxby in Sarah Waters novel Fingersmith is a baby farmer in the Gilbert and Sullivan opera HMS Pinafore, the character of Buttercup reveals that when a baby farmer, she had switched two babies of different social classes. This is part of a satire of class hierarchy in Victorian English. I remember last night being like, oh yeah, of course I remember that song, but I was also like a young teenager, so the whole meaning of it sort of flew over the, my head. Yeah. Other than it's like, haha, she switched, she switched babies, not that, oh, okay, she was actually a baby farmer. Farmer. Yeah. That was a thing. Yeah. And it was a whole critique on the classism of, of England. Yeah. Uh, the book Mama's Babies by Gary Crew is the story of a child of a baby farmer in the 1890s. The silent film Sparrows from 1926 with Mary Pickford was set in a baby farm in the southern swamps. Um, in the Ealing comedy film Kind Hearts and Coronets from 1949, set circa 1900, the hangman Mr. Elliot says, went up to Manchester on Monday, a poisoner, baby farmer at Holloway this morning. In the Fire Thief trilogy of novels, a baby farm figures prominently. The plot of Emma Donoghue's frog music is initiated by the protagonist retrieving her son from a baby farm. Australian musical The Hat Pin features a mother's experience with baby farmers and was inspired by the true story of Amber Murray and the Macon family. Australian poet Judith Rodriguez has written a series of poems based on Melbourne baby farmer Francis Knorr in The Hanging of Many Thwaites. The BBC TV soap opera East Enders features an evil character called Babe Smith who is exposed as a baby farmer along with Queenie Trot. It is revealed that while in Ramsgate they took young pregnant women in and sold their babies to the highest bidder. In a March 2013 episode of Sci-Fi's Haunted Collector, John Zaffis and his team discovered that a Boston cigar bar used to house a used to house a baby farm in the 1870s. Miss Elwood, who ran the farm, was found to have abused and even killed some of the infants there. They also found a syringe buried in the building's foundation, dating to the time period of the farm. So there we go. There's a whole bunch of yeah. Yeah. pop culture references and I was yeah I was, this got me thinking I added it to my um to my list of shiny things to write about someday I'd love to make a detective TV series that yeah uncovers um Amelia Dyer as the as you know baby farmer yeah and 400 murders and it's just amazing that yeah she's meant to be the most prolific serial killer it's like yeah. you don't even hear about it we always hear about you, you never Jack hear, the Ripper you never, and Ted Bundy. You, you never yeah. hear about Women. I think with the serial killers you do hear about they're the ones that seemingly they're always men the one they're always men and two they're the ones that seemingly seem to strike randomly you know what I mean? Like, but in public. Mm-hmm. So, like, Ted Bundy and Jack the Ripper. But, like, they literally took people off the street. Exactly. Yeah. And so it made, people of, and made people afraid to walk around. Yeah. Right? So anything that, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Particularly interesting MO. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Whereas people like Amelia Dyer, doing it for money, but she only ever targeted a very, very small subset of the population. Yeah, and she literally didn't go onto the streets breaching... Yeah, you know, people's privacy and safety, yeah. I guess, and taking people. Yeah. Like, she had them, you know, legitimately yeah. into her home and left there. Yeah. And then it's not like, yeah, them. it's not like you can walk or do your daily activities and be killed by Under Amelia Dyer. Yeah. Dyer. You could be a Jack the Ripper, yeah. but you wouldn't be by Amelia Dyer. Also, mm. she was a woman. Yeah. And people exactly. aren't interested in that. Exactly. Like, my favourite serial killer is um, Aileen Wernos. Mm. Yeah. And... Yeah, besides when Charlize Theron played her glamorously in Monster, um, and Christina Ricci was her bitch girlfriend. Yeah. Um, I hate you know, Christina Ricci. I love her. I love her, her too. Her face just she looks... She has a cute little moon face. Her moon face. She's like, 
She's always got this concerned look on her face. She's very concerned. I know, it's really weird. It's her one, it's her acting, it's her it. one thing, I it's her look. It. The I concern. hate it. She's concerned. a one-dimensional actress. A little bit, but... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, besides that big thing of yeah. pulling that story and going, oh, let's make that into a Hollywood movie and win Academy yeah. Awards, you know, it, it's true, we hardly ever hear about female but serial again, killers. But again, that serial killer ch- killed a very small subset of the population. She only killed people who hired her because she was a sex worker. Worker. If you don't hire a sex, if yeah. like if you if her story came out in the news, it was a case of oh this person is killing people who hire out as a mm. sex worker, right? Mm. If you don't hire, if you don't participate in sex work, you're not going to get killed. Yeah, it was very targeted. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Yeah. they only would scare the people who go oh shit I do. But only do. scare men who yeah. go around looking for Se- prostitutes at night. At night yeah. while they're hitchhiking on the street. Yeah. Like yeah. looking for yeah exactly. Like again, a very small subset yeah. of popular. Uh, of people and so it makes me think maybe women who do murder on a large scale compared to men who murder on a large scale women who murder on a large scale obviously seem to be more more calculated and have a particular motive in mind Mm -hmm. rather than that men that do it who literally probably will only do it for like a gratification or fueling Mm. of some some desire whereas the women do it for a reason like the like during really what a character in monster she was doing it uh, Ali and not. Initially, it was self-defense. It, yeah. According to the film, I don't know if it was. Oh, I've actually. seen I've seen documentaries interviewing her as well. Yeah. She always claimed it was self-defense yeah. at first, and then at, towards the end, it was. And more then it of just a became money. easier to take the money and kill them and get rid of the sex part. Yeah, don't blame her. Don't. Yeah, don't blame her. <laughs> I don't blame her. Don't blame her. Cut out the middle and, act. And, and same was it was money again. Again, with yeah. Dyer. Yeah. It was so maybe case. let's not put women on the streets. Yeah. How about give people the right? Give women the right education to make their own. <laughs> living well she had the right education she did but she was also a bit messed up she was pushed in the wrong direction yeah which can happen anyway yeah mm. anyway <laughs> interesting <laughs> article it was very what do you think Xander? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no baby fun. I don't want to talk I'm about too tired to have any real thoughts about oh. 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 well thanks for joining us yeah <laughs> it was fun <laughs> We'll leave it there. It's nice. better than scrolling social media. Thanks. Say, so yeah. Can you leave that as a review or now? <laughs> better, better than, than scrolling, scrolling social media. media. <laughs> Thanks for the one star, Sharon. <laughs> we love you, Sharon. <laughs> yeah. P.S. So we just reread the Wikipedia articles so don't do any research beforehand. No, I mean, this is probably the most research we've yeah. done, given that we, re- we recorded <laughs> it last night. Second read. The file became corrupted and I couldn't use it when I went to edit it today. Um, so we're doing it again. Two readings. Two like readings. Yeah. Um, that's as far as our research goes. I knew eventually <laughs> it was going to happen that we'd lose a file. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we'll leave it there. Yes. Thanks again to our patrons. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Xander, you better leave that review better than scrolling social media. <laughs> Consider it done. Awesome. Everyone else, leave us a review similar to that. Better. Than, better than that. Sharon's. <laughs> Better than a scrolling social media. I think that's my favourite. Okay. <laughs> All right. Alrighty. Okay, we'll see you next time. No, you got it right. Yay. Okay, bye. See you next time.